one final question and then uh, kick it up to the audience for a few minutes of questions. Um, so I, I guess this is to anybody who wants to answer it. Uh, you know, this week uh, we, you know, got this white paper about uh, the Obama administration's position on, uh, you know, drone attacks and or drone killings and, and other killings of American citizens. Um, what, what is the, the, you know, if, if this lawsuit accomplishes its goal and kind of knocks out indefinite detention for American citizens, uh, you know, strategically, does that make things worse if the, you know, administration still retains the right to kill American citizens, you know, if it, if it can't capture them? Um, and, uh, you know, is there, is there any uh, relationship between, uh, you know, this lawsuit and that, and, and uh, you know, that power which the administration... Well, let me start with this. I mean, what has happened is that we have undergone a corporate coup d'etat, and it's over. They won. Um, the uh, major structural assaults uh, carried out by the Bush administration have been embraced by the Obama administration, all of them. Whether it is the expansion of imperial war, drone attacks, the looting of, Wall, uh, the, looting of the U.S. Treasury by Wall Street, um, and most importantly, the assault on civil liberties. The assault on civil liberties under the Obama administration is worse than under the Bush administration. The radical interpretation of the AUMF to authorize the assassination of American citizens. The FISA Amendment Act, which retroactively makes legal what under our Constitution has traditionally been illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of American citizens. And we know that all our personal information is stored out in supercomputers in Utah. The use of the Espionage Act, which Dan spoke about, to shut down whistleblowers. I have friends who do investigative journalism, and they will tell you they can't even get a government official to talk to them anymore on background for fear of going to jail. Anything that challenges the official narrative, anyone within the system of power with a conscience who rises up to expose war crimes committed by our government will no longer speak. And finally, the NDAA. And you have to ask why. Why is there a steady assault stripping away of our most cherished civil liberties. What's happening? And what's happening is that the corporate state, which is, to use a business term, harvesting the nation, stealing as much as fast as they can on the way down, knows that the combination of economic decline and climate change will eventually, and they're running scenarios, I can assure you, in the NSA and everywhere else. They know that eventually there will be blowback. Eventually, people will respond. And they want the powers to, in essence, criminalize any form of dissent. And that's what this is about. Well, I'd, I'd, yeah, sorry. And I, I, sorry, I, yeah, David. I, no, I, I, just, I disagree with absolutely none of that. And there, there's extraordinary <laughs> reason to be distraught in, in general um, about uh, the state of, uh, of, of state of our country in many respects. Um, but for some reason, in a way that's somewhat counterintuitive to cynics like myself, I've got that strange mix of I idealism and cynicism, um, there is actually still a lot of esteem, even in the Congress, around the notion that we should fix this. It's kind of shocking. Uh, that's part of why we've decided to do this joint lawsuit uh, public campaign effort, because there are synergies to build between the two efforts. I mean, turning people out like you know, to events like this, getting the press to uh, pay attention to what's going on, um, increases the chance that our arguments might sink into the head of one of the judges or justices who's got to decide about this issue. It also demonstrates that people are, are concerned. Behavior is being altered because of this law, and that's sort of the crux of our argument. This creates a chilling effect that constrains people. Then, of course, if you get to the extraordinary uh, sort of situation where there's so much popular outcry, uh, it might actually compel justices to act in a way that protects the institution, protects the, uh, the judicial branch, and protects their own, uh, their own power. Uh, then on, on the legislative side, of course, this popular outcry is extraordinarily important, even if we don't live in a country where the small d democratic uh, effect is, is as predominant as it, as it ought be and as perhaps it was. Uh, there's legislation that came surprisingly close to passing on the House side a little bit less than a year ago, uh, a 240 to 180 vote or thereabouts. Um, it, such that, and this won't surprise many people in this audience, that if the Democrats had all actually stood together and voted the right way on it, we would have won. It was a coalition of uh, conscientious Democrats and a few dozen libertarian-leaning Republicans. 
Also a, a, a similar attempt, a more complicated one on the Senate side just a couple of months ago. So the judicial track is incredibly important, but please also don't give up on the legislative track uh, and Demand Progress and many other groups have been helping lead on that front. And I, I know uh, by virtue of what I've seen happen on, just on the Demand Progress side alone that hundreds of thousands of people have contacted their elected officials about this <coughs> law. So there is still a modicum of hope there too. And uh, we want to we want to wrap things up pretty quickly. How much time do we have left here? We have five minutes. Five minutes. So um, why don't we uh, raise your hand if you have a question? Uh, I'll try to take uh, two or three, and then uh, you know hand them back to the panelists. Um, just two, actually. Okay. Yeah. You right there. Um, do you think that the taking away of the Second Amendment right has anything also involved in this? Okay, uh, question for the panel. Uh, does this have anything to do with gun rights? And then uh, somebody else. <laughs> right there. Uh, how do you think things went in court today? Yeah, okay. We'll start with that. Lawyers, how did it go in court today? How did it go in court? Some, I, I saw that it looked like they had some tough questions for you, but also some tough questions for the government. We were pretty tough, too. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, I, I, I'll say this, that you know, you, don't, you never know what's on the mind of a judge. And they did ask us about this seeming exception in the law that says, you know, existing law as to Americans or people in the U.S. who are detained is not altered. And the judges said, well, doesn't that mean there's no problem here, at least as to citizens? And we answered, of course, it says, though, that it applies to people detained in the U.S. And so it presumes they're going to be detained under some law, and the only law we know of is this law. And I said to Judge Lowe here, I think when the government gets back up, you ought to ask them, well, what other laws before this one allowed the military to detain people in this country? And so at the end, if you recall, who, if you were there, he said, you know, Mr. Afrin dared us to ask you this question. And uh, it's a little technique because judges forget <laughs> things. And you got to say, Judge, ask them this. And uh, when the government, Mr. Lowe got back up, he didn't have an answer. He said, I, I don't know of one. And that's very significant. I don't know what will happen. You can't predict what judges do. I don't know that they're against us. I think they were testing this point to see whether, how would we would respond. Um, and I, I would never guess. I would simply say we had a full and well flushed out argument. Carl, what do you think? It reminded me of when we, uh, when we argued the preliminary injunction uh, hearing uh, back in March. Um, the same pattern occurred afterwards. Uh, Tangerine took us to the anteroom. She told us all the things, the arguments that we should have made, we didn't make, and how we were definitely going to lose. And then we won. So the same thing happened here, and I'm hoping we'll get the same result. But it's impossible, it's impossible to predict what, what, what judges will do. And uh, Tangerine, maybe you can ask, answer the question about the, the Second Amendment, because I, I remember you, you said that uh, the, there's an amicus uh, brief from the Gun Owners of America, is that correct? Gun Owners Association of America. Uh, that was I don't part. think I'm the best one to answer no. that. Okay, all right. Well, how did, how did you get them to sign on, and, and why did they sign on? Well, Anyone? <laughs> well, let, me say, well, let me say this. Yeah. The conservatives are not our enemies. You know, you got to realize that. The conservatives and liberals share a lot in common. The people, and the President Obama's wrong. He thinks he's going to alienate Republicans if he vetoes these types of laws. He's wrong. He'd get support from Republicans if he take these positions. They're not our enemies. The judges that Carl and I often do best with, frankly, are conservative judges because they have a great libertarian tradition. And so, you know, I, I don't know where we, you know, how the gun owners directly would view this case or us if we say the Second Amendment should be changed. But I would use that question as a pivot to say, liberals and conservatives have a lot in common. And that's what makes the country great, that we share common values. This division between them is artificial. The conservatives believe in, in civil liberties. They believe in free speech. The greatest supporter of free speech in the United States right now, who would you say it is? Scalia. Scalia. Give whoever that is a prize, because I can't see you. <laughs> it's Justice Scalia. And if you're looking to protect free speech, you don't want to go with liberals. You need Scalia first. Well, we'll let uh, Daniel well, uh, close things out. I just to agree entirely with what you, Chris said. In fact, I had it thinking of saying it at the press conference this morning, and you said it for me here perfectly well. They, one thing does have to be kept in mind, not to be celebrated exactly right now, but as a challenge. We don't live 
in a police state now. We don't expect to leave this room and be rounded up into Black Mariah's on the way to prison for what we've said. As we, as the, and the day may come when that will be a very different matter. What we have is the complete infrastructure of a police state, both physically in terms of prisons, but in terms of computer lists and GPS uh, roundings where they will know exa they know exactly where we are at this point. What, uh, what there's a lot of dots well, on they, the map. Well, they don't need it right now, but uh, the moment they need it, they yeah. click the switch. If they need it, they, they can click a switch. For years I've said, one more 9-11, and who could say, right or left, that that's impossible? One more major 9-11, and Muslims and Middle Easterners will be in camps to a much greater extent than Japanese were. Uh, I think there was 110,000 then, and we held a lot more here. And some of us here will be in there. We're not there yet. Uh, there has been very little opposition, if any, in Congress to this, uh, or the president. Both parties have done it. As he said, it's been part, be part by part. It hasn't been totally switched yet. We have people like, uh, and just to show, as somebody said here, that politicians are all mixed bags, and you can uh, you can ally on certain points. It was um, a McCain just recently who, with Feinstein, another hero of mine, Feinstein and Levin, who complained about the vicious government propaganda in Zero Dark Thirty, which I think will have an extremely bad effect on the normalization of uh, of uh, torture in this country, just as. Obama has decriminalized torture, decriminalized financial speculation, and now essentially the surveillance and the detention. But the difference is that whereas that has gone on bit by bit, I used to think if there's another 9-11, NSA will be turned on us, you know, like a pinball machine. Wrong, it didn't take another 9-11. One 9-11 was enough, enough to do that, so we've got that. But the point being that we can use and we must use occasions like this now. The big question is what to do about it. People in this room essentially agree with Chris, agree with me, uh, agree with him, but what to do? We formed That's very Congress. hard, okay. very hard. Uh, and we need, creative, we need creative thinking about it. I think the, a, any answer that just says more of the past, bigger demonstrations, more letters, can't be right. It's got to, it's got to be imagination here. We've got to use uh, the kind of elements that they're using, the cybernet. And, uh, and other capabilities like that, but what to do to uh, regain a state that is not uh, on the verge, that is not proto or quasi-fascism, is of extreme importance now. I just okay. want to say really quickly, uh, very quickly, last comment. that we focus on the executive c constantly. We need to reform the branch that belongs to the people, which is the Congress. It's our legislative branch. Government's independence derives from its dependence on the people alone. The congressional branch needs to be strengthened. It will strengthen every other, it will strengthen its check against the executive and it will also strengthen ju the judicial branch. We need to reform our political parties, start new political parties, and do that kind of populist movement because okay. there will be no reform. The, the executive isn't going to reform itself for us. All right, um, on that note, uh, let's give a round of applause to everybody. And we're going to be doing a very quick five-minute intermission, maybe a two-minute intermission yeah, at this don't point. Get too comfortable. Yeah.